Hey guys, welcome to a sweaty holy shed. <laughs> it's a record apparently, isn't it? First time in the UK that we've recorded temperatures over 30 degrees for six days on the trot in September. I love the sunshine, but you know, it's all that humidity. Um, you get the feeling something's going on, don't you? Something's not quite right with our climate. And it was bloody hot this morning, I can tell you, preaching at St. Leonard's Church under a cassock alb. Why the heck didn't I wear shorts underneath it? I don't know. I got halfway to church and suddenly thought, you stupid boy, you're wearing black jeans. You know, you should you should have shorts on. Anyway, I had a great time uh, preaching on the bit in Matthew. You know that bit where uh, it tells us that, you know, if someone pisses us off, this is what we have to do. Um, good fun. I mean, great thing about the, the lectionary readings are you never know what's going to come your way. Um, but I had good fun with it. And if you want to hear uh, uh, more about it, I'll post a link once it's available. Now, if you've been here in the Holy Shed in recent weeks, you know that I've committed myself to writing a new book. Um, I, I've told you that really so that you can hold me to account. <laughs> and that I'm using these talks, for the time being anyway, as a way of turning over the ground in my thinking, as it were. Um, I've already mentioned how I was once described as a liberal evangelist and how that joke, as I saw it, took root in my consciousness as a, you know, a pretty accurate descriptor of who I am. Uh, although to be a little bit pedantic, I probably prefer progressive evangelist or even postmodern evangelist better still but who's arguing whichever way my real passion is speaking to the so-called nuns in our society people identifying as not religious but who i often find have a lot of spiritual intelligence and are absolutely not anti-religion mostly but just fundamentally uninspired unconvinced by you know religion as they perceive it to be as indeed I am too and, and I guess you are so they have it in a nutshell I'm writing and doing most things that I do including the holy shed in order to offer uh, a gospel message and a notion of God which are more believable and credible to the average non who lives in a world shaped not by religion anymore but by an outlook based on modern science modern cosmology and by a culture which is much more inclusive than christianity tends to be portrayed as um, by a culture which is bored and disaffected by the archaisms of conventional religion so the first thing i want to say to such people is Forget what you think you know about God and about religion. And let's talk about it. Let's have another look at what these things might be when you've got rid of all of the previous stuff out of the picture. Because any notion of God as a usually male supernatural being up there somewhere has completely lost traction with today's people who now kind of know what is up there and it ain't God and angels and heaven and, you know, harps and all that kind of stuff. It's endless eons of space. Add to that the idea that the fate of every single human being was dictated by an errant woman leading her bloke astray back in the mists of time of mythology and, um, and an angry God requiring their blood all of our blood but satisfied by the spilt blood of his son you know all that story that we've looked at in the shed i mean i need not really say more it just doesn't add up it just doesn't cut it with thinking sensible people today you know thinking nuns of course some christian critics uh, think i'm abdicating Christianity, that I'm abdicating Christian tradition, surrendering to secularism, relativism, and all kinds of other unpleasant isms. Well, that's not true, actually. Uh, a radical approach to theology, which is another descriptor that I happily accept, by the way, 
radical approach to theology isn't abandoning the tradition. I think it's actually being faithful to it by digging deeper into its roots, connecting with its originating sources and asking how that might be recontextualized, as it always has been, by the way, through history, but how it can be recontextualized, how it can be reimagined and reinvented for a new situation, for our situation. And you'll note that in saying this, I am assuming or wagering that there is something going on in this tradition that is worth looking into, that's worth pursuing, that's worth experiencing, that's worth holding on to and carrying forward into a new place. In the very best sense, what I'm talking about is called mission. It's not a great word for many of us, is it? <laughs> because it's got so many kind of, uh, you know, meanings loaded onto it. But mission, properly speaking, isn't a relentless, unthinking repetition of the past, regardless of how irrelevant and absurd that repetition is to people today. Mission is, properly speaking, is a reconfiguring, a recontextualizing of the core and the originating spiritual source of the tradition in a new setting. I mean, I say it over and over again with no apologies. A tradition should never be thought of as something fixed, static, unyielding, deep frozen in order to preserve it exactly as it's always been. That's not tradition. That's traditional ism, which is quite another thing. No, I think the tradition, like its cousin, culture, a living tradition, is a constantly evolving, reforming stream of consciousness, which remains forever connected to or rooted in its past, but not governed by the past, not governed by past incarnations or understandings or by you know, limited understandings which are now overtaken by time and progress. The way I've often described the process of progress is by speaking of a new innocence. Okay, so on a personal level, like many others, my spiritual journey began with an innocent, wide-eyed acceptance of exactly what I was taught. I just bought it all. But with time, common sense, and critical thinking, prompted by living in the 20th century, now 21st century, uh, that first innocence I once enjoyed became tainted, corrupted by all kinds of anomalies, problems and things that just didn't add up, until eventually the innocence uh, is all gone and you're sort of beginning to feel a little bit kind of hacked by it all, you know, you, you feel a bit taken for a ride by it all and you wonder why you ever did buy into it. And it's at this point in the process that a hell of a lot of people just abandon ship, you know. Um, they see faith as this childlike innocence lost in a grown-up world. And I understand all of that. I've been exactly in that place um, with no more religious road to travel on and wondering if the best thing really would be to just um, put it all behind me and get on with life in some other sort of realm. However, with persistence and the wisdom of others who've passed this way before me to draw on, a lot of helpful scholarship that's out there, and the help of a decent spade to dig with, I wagered that there were hidden depths to dig down into, to explore in my Christian tradition. And a second innocence, or a third, or a fourth, or however many, I realised was possible. Now that's never returning to the first innocence, never returning to where I started. That's gone now, that's been shattered, and there's no way, you know, it's like a some that you've dropped on the floor and it's broken into a thousand pieces. You're never going to put that back together again now. But that said, a new innocence, a fresh source of wonder and delight in what I now see 
as a grown-up understanding and experience of faith appropriate to this world, that becomes possible. And that's really the story of my life, really. It started off with wide-eyed innocence. It got shattered through passing through the, the kind of pathways of critical thought and questioning and doubt. And then instead of sort of abandoning ship, I pressed on to find a further place of innocence. And in fact, I think it's not just a one-off. I think that's something that, you know, is, is going on perpetually. And I believe this is where Dietrich Bonhoeffer was at when in a Nazi prison in 1944, he wrote those famous words. He said, what is bothering me incessantly is the question what Christianity really is or indeed, who Christ really is for us today. I think that's such a wonderful, pithy sort of question that, that brings so much into focus. This incessant question, what is Christian? What really is Christianity? When you get rid of all of the palaver. Um, and who is Jesus Christ for us today? It was for Bonhoeffer, an expression of radical struggle, um, a question about then and now, you know, that was then, this is now, of reimagining faith uh, for a new age, for a new setting. Here's my thing, you see, I believe that something extraordinary occurred in the world with the appearance of Jesus. You know, I, that is part of my innocence now. I believe that something extraordinary occurred in the world with the appearance of Jesus, with his life and his teaching, with his conflict with the powers of empire and religious authority, uh, which led to his execution, of course. Something extraordinary happened in the lives of his disciples, his followers, and their experience of his continued presence among them beyond his death. But of course, they understood all of this in the light of the world they lived in, which is not our world. And so whilst we may uh, accept, as I certainly do, that, that something extraordinary happened, when we come to explaining that, putting that into words and trying to conceptualise it, um, we live in a different world and some people want to just keep us locked back there, you know, kind of hanging on to the past. However, I believe we can unearth that something extraordinary reconfigured in the context of our world. But to get there, there's no easy route in a way. We must be prepared to wrestle with some hard questions and not imagine that there's an easy kind of like-for-like like equivalence between past and present, that you can just sort of read the past into the present, hey presto, you know, you, we can't do that. And um, uncritical orthodoxy and fundamentalism do offer an innocence, that, but I think they offer a false innocence. That's the one that I once experienced and was shattered, and maybe that's true of you as well. I think orthodoxy, uncritical orthodoxy, and fundamentalism really offer blind faith, regardless of whatever other thought or evidence or reason there is to, uh, to wrestle with. It's what theologians call fideism, fideism, which literally means faithism. And I've seen a lot of faithism in my life. I was caught up with it for too long, um, it's a belief that faith is at odds with reason, okay? So we have to trust ourselves to faith alone without reason. That's what you call fideism. And it is a spiritual, psychological and emotional dead end. Um, unless you just close your eyes and go la 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 la, uh, you know, and just keep hold of the same old things, keep going in that fashion, uh, unless you do that, 
um, you will find yourself coming to the to a dead end where it just no longer adds up it no longer makes sense the real question which i think is what bonhoeffer is asking is what is really going on here you know in the christian you know and all that what's going on here beneath the surface issues of faith is there something else all this stuff that we struggle with and set aside and want to leave behind and you know unravels around us is there something beneath all of that worth digging for you know beneath the hullabaloo of conventional religion and theology is there something going on uh, beneath the obsession with with you know right sets of words or right rituals you know all that kind of orthodoxy stuff beneath imposed orthodoxies um, is there something going on i long ago discovered that the wells of fundamentalism of conventional and orthodox uh, orthodox christianity uh, biblical inerrancy and all the stuff that goes with that i finally discovered that well is bone dry for me there was nothing left to find there that fed my soul that intrigued and interested my mind uh, it just was like a dry well but somehow somehow i hung on and i sometimes don't know how or why that was call it god call it something in me but somehow i hung on and wagered that there was something going on in christian tradition in the christ event as we call it that would yet feed my soul that would lead me to a fresh innocence of faith something that would bring joy and delight and pleasure and wonder into my life um, instead of just an unraveling of questions conservatives um, in the religious world dislike the notion of radical radical is like a swear word you know but radical doesn't mean dismissive that's very very important radical doesn't mean dismissive of tradition it means to rethink to reconfigure to reimagine to reform um, to get down to the roots of things in the pursuit of what's really going on down there if anything it is to unearth you know what we can truly own for ourselves to discover what we can really believe and not just pretend to believe or not just conform in believing like some you know awful kind of you know game of charades or something being radical is finding out what can i really believe to find out what christianity really is and who christ is for us today von hoffer's words the important thing is you know i am not about dismantling anyone's i don't i don't take any pleasure of going out and sort of I, it's it's not like a fun hobby for me let's go and sort of just throw a few hand grenades around here and let's just upset people in their faith in and shatter their innocence that's not how it works at all why why would i do that why would why would that even be an interest where is their love or kindness in in just you know shattering the innocent faith of others um i do often say when i'm when i'm preaching i've often said to congregations if you don't have any doubts or questions please see me afterwards and i'll share a few of mine because i've got plenty to go around um but no what i'm about is trying to help people whose faith has already become dismantled or is unraveling and to help them to dig deeper for things that they some solid ground you know things that they really can believe things that they will find sustaining without any pretense over the past 30 years of doing this endlessly do you know i mean for 30 years i've had people especially you know i've i've had clergy church ministers coming to see me asking if under the sort of you know darkness of anonymity they can take me out for lunch or go for a walk in the park or have a drink to have a conversation they can't have 
in their church with their congregation or, or with their bishop or superintendent or whoever it may be. Um, but also lots of other people who are not clergy, all kinds of people over the years. It's been the, the you know the largest part probably of my pastoral work for 30 years, been having those conversations. And um, so many people have told me that it, that that was gospel for them, you know, it was good news. That, that first of all is the relief of being able to admit to things that you don't and you can't really believe. But then also to have a conversation which doesn't give you a, a whole new fresh version of it, but which points you and helps you and affirms you on a journey of trying to, to, to make sense, to dig down deeper for yourself. So, you know, I guess that does make me some kind of evangelist. A bearer of good news, I, I do hope so. I could distill much of my evangelistic ministry, my liberal evangelistic ministry, down to this, down to this statement. Dare to think for yourself. That's a huge part of my message. And the dare is, is basically saying that it's not easy you know it's not easy daring to do something it it involves a certain measure of risk and um and that's why part of the, the role of being an evangelist to such people is to give them the assurance that they're okay to ask these questions and to just support them as they do that and perhaps you know fear and panic and anxiety can can surface in the process of this I've watched some people, you know, hover at that point for ages. You know, it's a little bit like watching them standing on the edge of a pool, wondering whether to jump in or not. Will I just sink to the bottom? Will I drown in waves of doubts and questions? Will there be no way to get fresh air again, to get back up out of it all? What if I discover that the whole thing is a delusion and there's nothing to it? Hard questions, I know, but ultimately, good questions. And um, you know, it was—it's it, the stuff that Holy Joe's was made of for ten years in in a pub uh, in Clapham. It was you know, wave after wave of people coming along, just needing the space to ask questions, needing to jump into the pool with knowing that there were kind of lifeguards around, that there were people. Who, who who would say it's okay, you can do this. Because, you know, nodding in all the right places, ticking the right boxes, burying one's questions, going along to get along, you know, it, <laughs> it's not hard. You, you can feel, it can feel comforting and reassuring. And I've had people say, no, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't ask me. I don't, I don't want to have those questions. But the thing is, guys, it's the easy way out. You know, orthodoxy, fundamentalism as packages are the easy way out because it's like just following a straight line from here to there um, there are no complications as it were but from my experience it's a road to a lot of frustration I know a heck of a lot of people who've ended up in therapy because they've tried to do that and the real joy the real joy comes from you know trusting my gut Daring to think for myself, trusting my own instincts. Um, not that they're going to be infallible and always right, but trusting them, going with them, and being prepared to question them as well along the way. You know, that's what real faith is to me, and trusting ourselves to a process, but entrusting ourselves ourselves to, you know, the arms of eternal love which are underneath us all the time even when we're not aware of it well that's a bit of a foundation for some things that i want to go on to say there's so much more that i could go on and spout on about but um that'll be enough for today i think um i just leave you with you know that thought to ponder over about daring to think and look around you and see the people that you know who are going through this process rather painfully um and I think it's important for people who aspire to be progressive, uh, liberal, whatever, to, to, to overbound most of all 
in, in love and empathy and to be support to people who are going through times of deconstruction. They're necessary, but they're difficult and can create an awful lot of anxiety. So if you're going through that now or you know someone that is, my heart goes out to you and that's why I do this thing week after week. Okay, so let's have a prayer. Which is about daring to think. I doubt that my doubts offend you, creator of curiosity and inquisitiveness. Even when I question your existence or protest angrily what I imagine in my confusion is your responsibility. Or when I tell you that I might as well talk to the wall or march off in a huff, you smile, I'm sure, or shed a tear for the pain. I think your heart must swell with pride when you see us, creatures of dust, daring to use the powers bequeathed us, wondering, delving, doubting, speculating, digging, hoping, reversing, inventing, disbelieving and believing again, sceptically. May the tumbling creative chaos of our minds know serenity, courage and wisdom in our hungry search for the whole. Amen. Oh, okay, good. Well, I think what we're going to do is have a little drink to that, don't you? Um, so, what should I do? I've got, I've got a cup of tea here. A bit hot for that. I've got some cold Coke. I think I'll go for the Coke. So, if you've got a drink, please join me in a toast. A toast to the incredible gift of intellect. A toast to courage. Courage to think, to rethink, to reverse to try again. A toast to expressions of faith that we really can believe in when you suddenly feel this is solid ground. Here's to all those things, to life, Lime. Oh, that's nice. Okay, well, that's it for today, guys. If you like what I'm about, what I'm doing here in the shed, you can support us. You can buy us a coffee by just following the link on the screen. It's also always at the top posts on the Holy Shed Facebook page. And um, we're deeply grateful to you for all your love and all your support in this way and, and lots of others as well. Thank you so much. And there we are. Um, Friday this week, I'm doing a pause for thought. I've, sort of, I've agreed to do three extras, of, I think three or two in the next two or three weeks. Yeah, so I'm on the Zoe Ball show on friday it's about 7 15 in the morning on radio 2 and if you can join me that'd be great but i'll always be posting up the links afterwards anyway you can find them on sounds actually and um that's it go well be kind to this lovely world of ours be kind to people that you meet especially those who are struggling or in pain be kind to yourself Stay human, stay cool, and I'll see you soon.